It's August 10th, 2023. This is the best of Rook. There. Welcome to episode 278 of Rook. I'm Gian Gomeshi. Hello to you from Toronto, from Canada. Salam, Dustan Aziz. Durud Bashama. Hope you are doing well wherever you are tuning in from around the world. We are on our ongoing mission to build a new audiovisual encyclopedia of Iranian diaspora identity. So today's episode is part of a Best of Rook series we are bringing to you for the entire month of August, where we're looking back at some of our favorite interviews over the last three and a half years since we launched, and some of our most moving and entertaining moments, and we're giving them to you. We've curated our faves, and we hope you check out these conversations, especially if you may have missed them the first time, including this one, a special one. Today on the program, she is an icon of Iranian law and history in the last half century, a professor, an author, a celebrated activist for the promotion of democracy. She was one of the first female attorneys to oppose the Islamization of gender relations following the revolution of 1979. Mehrangiza Kaur has been at the epicenter of change, ideas, and tragedy inside Iran and in the diaspora. And she agreed to a very personal interview here in the Rook studio about her life, about experiencing loss, and about lessons learned moving forward. We will bring you Mehrangiza Kar, an interview that is both in English and in Persian in just a moment. We're coming to you on rookmedia.com. That's the website, and it is where you can link to all of our platforms. We are on Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Instagram, CastBox. If you want to see the visuals while you're listening to Rook, switch over to YouTube right now. And if you like your Rook descriptions and bulletins in English and in Persian, check us out on Telegram. You can be a supporter of this program by going to that website, rookmedia.com and becoming a Rook member by pressing the Support Us button, which will lead you to the Patreon page, and it's where you can subscribe to us for a few dollars a month to become a Rook member and support what we do. Also, you can become a sponsor or advertiser on Rook by emailing us at info at rookmedia.com. We appreciate it. Okay, let's get started. Our guest on the best of Rook today is a leading attorney, a professor, and author. She's also a celebrated activist for the promotion of democracy, the rule of law, and human rights in Iran. Mehrangiza Kar was born in Ahvaz, Iran. She moved to Tehran to study at the Faculty of Law and Political Science at the University of Tehran and graduated with a law degree in 1967. Mehrangiz was one of the first female attorneys to oppose the Islamization of gender relations following the revolution of 79. She became an active public defender in Iran's civil and criminal courts. And in the year 2000, Mehrangiz attended a conference at the Heinrich Boll Institute in Berlin entitled Iran After the Elections. Upon her return to Iran, she was arrested, she was taken to Evin prison, and sentenced to four years in jail. Following that episode, since the early 2000s, she relocated to the United States. She has been a Radcliffe Fellow at Harvard University and has served as a Fellow at the National Endowment for Democracy, the Woodrow Wilson Center, the American University in Washington, D.C., the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, Columbia University, and the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government. Mehrangiz is the recipient of many international awards, including the 2002 International Human Rights Prize, the 2000 Penn Novib Award, and in 2004, she was honored by Human Rights First. She's also been recognized as a scholar at risk through an international network of universities and colleges working to promote academic freedom and to defend scholars worldwide. She is the author of numerous articles and more than 20 critically acclaimed books, She's a frequent media commentator on events in Iran and was working on three new books at the time of this interview. This is an interview with Mehran Gizakar in the Rook studio. Here's our conversation. Hello. Hello. 
And what a pleasure it is to have you here. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for doing this. And, you know, we agreed that uh, I'll be asking the questions in English, but however you feel comfortable, including in, in Persian and Farsi, you. if you want to answer. Thank you. Um, Marangis, it's, it's very difficult preparing for an interview with someone like you. I have to say, you, you've lived such an important and impactful life. Uh, and you have so much to say about politics, about human rights, contemporary issues, history. One barely knows where to start. I thought in this interview we would go a little more personal, your story, mm -hmm. your feelings, mm -hmm. and lessons that you have learned and can impart through the wisdom you've gained. Is, is that okay? Yeah, of course. You know, let me start by asking you then about the way you divide your life when you look back. Because I've heard you say that there are two Marangis periods, <laughs> before and after the year 2000, which obviously was a very pivotal year. And I mentioned in the introduction what happened to you in 2000. But I'm wondering if there are actually three acts so far. Marangis and her life before 1979... Marangiz and her work from 79 to 2000 in Iran, and then the period of the last 20 years, predominantly outside of Iran. Does that make sense yeah, to you? Yeah, yeah, that's great. Okay. Then let's go back to the Act One and uh, uh, how you became who you are. You were born in Ahvaz in the 1940s. It's where my fa my family, you know this on my dad's side, was also from. What, what, um, what kind of kid were you growing up in Ahvaz? I can describe myself. At that age, I was very weak, and all the time I was sick. Really? <laughs> yes. You were a sick kid? Uh, yes, and um, allergic, um, you know, allergic kid. And, uh, but uh, I loved school. I loved learning. Opinionated, buddy. Were you, did you? No, I cannot. In... Inside myself, yes, but I was very shy kid, and I never talked loud, you know, uh, my thinking about everything or my opinion. Very so, conservative. So in your early teens, for example, in Ahwaz, mm -hmm. you would have never guessed that you would become somebody who people around the world know as a commentator in the media, as a leading attorney, as an outspoken person? No, I could not predict my future. You know, my goal was being a doctor. <laughs> oh, you were going to be a doctor? Yeah, yeah. It, to it, please the it, family, it my, or you were actually no, no, interested? No, no. I, I was actually interested, because in uh, high school, I chose Tajrabi. Tajrabi, like science. Mm -hmm. uh, so my goal was that. But I thought I had heard that uh, you were interested in literature when you were young. Yeah, literature was my... Uh, passion. Passion. Um, but for my profession in future, uh, I was doing so hard for being a doctor, medical. Pastichot. Concur, concur. <laughs> oh, Yanni, you didn't get a good enough mark? No, no, I couldn't. Oh, interesting. I, I couldn't. But in uh, law school and political school, uh, I, you know, I found you excelled. very good grade. And it was my second choice, not my first choice. So do you still want to be a doctor? Uh, sometimes... When I do not have money, and every day is like that. <laughs> <laughs> you, you look at the family dentist yeah, and yeah. think I made the I'm wrong choice. I'm sorry that <laughs> why I'm not a doctor. <laughs> I, but let me, I, I was, where I was going with the opinions thing is that you've become so well known, not just for your opinions, but the strength of your character and what you fought for over the years. Um, so when you were a kid, you said you had those opinions inside. I mean, what are your earliest memories, Batshik? Well, did you mm -hmm. remember looking at things and going, yeah. that's not right. That shouldn't be happening. Yeah. That, that woman shouldn't be treated that way or, or whatever it might be. Yes, because, you know, my opinion uh, was very cultural, more than political, because I couldn't understand what is, you know, the best... Uh, mm, public policy or something like that, mm. or what kind of government. Uh, I couldn't understand such a thing. But we had the, 
situation around ourselves that uh, very عقب مونده فرهنگی عقب افتاده فرهنگی اگر culturally backward culturally yeah uh, we, we were living you know the center of ahwaz and around us you know those people they were living and uh, their opinion to women uh, was terrible every week i could understand that a woman or a daughter was killed around us wow. you know when when uh, we ask who killed her i heard brother father or sometimes uncle wow because she was doing something that uh, and that was not uh, traditional like sexual relation with somebody else yeah. except uh, their husband or sometimes the daughter who they didn't have family shuma conservative budan no 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 family you grew man, up in a liberal family man qati pati budan na mitunam begam i cannot say that my family was very religious i uh-huh. cannot say my family uh, was uh, laic or secular or such a thing um, but you know nobody was denying islam mm. including your family including my my family especially my family because my mother if i want to explain that uh, by our language now i can say my mother was moderate muslim uh-huh. mionero islam mionero my grandmom was radical muslim really <laughs> like um, Uh, wow. So what would your grandmother think of you now? Uh, you know, she had not power when uh-huh. my mother was the boss of my family. She had not power. She couldn't uh, ask me hijab by force because my mother was standing and my mother had hijab. But my mother didn't give permission to my grandma to you know to say uh, mehri should be like that like this no she couldn't do that you know i was going to ask you whether you had female role models that shaped you i remember speaking with homer sashar about her early years and and she's in iran around the same time as you growing up although she was she was born in shiraz and she said it was the strong women in her family that gave her the path and confidence to be a leader as a young woman was that true for you yeah it is true my mother was very powerful and uh, she didn't uh, go to school modern school uh, but uh, she could read hafiz she could read very well quran and sometimes without you know looking at hafiz mitunest hafiz ro az bar bekhune mo migoftim mo ga az bar yani tu hafizash hafiz rafte bud wow ya va masalan tu khune ma ye ittefaqi ke oftade bud do ta zan tu ye in khune hukumat mikardan my mom and my grandma and they would somehow sometimes yeah. conflict yeah. with each other yeah. C- conflict with each other <laughs> one was my mom yes with hafiz para inke zanay mahalle hame khob hame narahat budan nigaran budan giriftari dashtan va un tabaqe mutawassit payin am budim ma nemitunam begam tuy tabaqat bala budim tabaqe mutawassit payin budim un moqe tabaqe bala am baz farqi nemikard دوست داشتن فال بگیرن ببینن سرنوشتشون حال و احوالشون چجوری میشه مادر من قبول میکرد که برای اینا فال حافظ بگیره و بعد خودش ترجمه میکرد حافظ رو یعنی اینکه تفسیر میکرد براشون interpretation interpretation میداد که مثلا مربوط میشد به زندگی اون به احوال اون این یک حوزه قدرت بود اونجا که طبیعتا فالوور می آورد زنایی که می شدن فالوور و می اومدن نوبت می گرفتن و اون برش فال میگه قدرت میاره دیگه شما هرچی ارتباطت بیشتر باشه با کامیونیتی 
قدرتمند میشی خب این زن اینجوری قدرتمند شده بود ولی اینجا یه چیزی there's something interesting about that that I, I, I know of course I'm not the first one to say this and, and there's there's books and books and books are written about mm-hmm. this that, that you'd be more familiar with but I've always found there's an interesting paradox in the way we talk about Iran uh, not just in his, historically but even now and uh, the, a patriarchal society mm-hmm. and women being repressed and and you know women not having the legal power etc and yet when i think of most iranian families the center of power in the family is usually the mother the strongest person in the yeah. family is usually yeah, the woman yeah. uh, and it's an interesting yeah. dichotomy can yeah. you speak to that yeah my mother was very powerful and uh, you know I can say during the time uh, she was intellectual mm. because uh, she was looking at uh, Iranian daughters and she was saying me and not advising me but forcing me that you should be in the future prime minister. Wow. And I couldn't understand yeah. what is that, why I... I should be, when I was seven years old, six years old, I couldn't understand what is that. And another uh, woman, my grandmom was استخاره می کرد. استخاره می دونید چیه؟ نه استخاره می دونید. مثلا تو می خواهی بری دکتر بشی میگه بر من استخاره کن. بی بی. ببین من مثلا این کار بکنم یا نه. بعد اون برای مردم استخاره می کرد. اونا می اومدن اونا که خیلی مسلمون بودن اونایی که دنبال عشق و عاشقی و مثلا شوهرشون حالا رفته بود با یه زن دیگه نمیدونم از این کارا می برن پیش مادر من اون براشون فالا حافظ می گره. پس ببینین دوتاییشون سنتر یه بخشی از کامینیتی بودن بنابراین قدرت داشتن در این حال که پول نداشتن ولی یه قدرت ارتباطی داشتن So it wasn't really a surprise that Marangi Zakara ends up going uh, to College of Law and, and Political Science in Tehran <laughs> University with that with the, the strong, strong kind of role models that you had. You do that, you graduate in the late 1960s. You start working at the Institute of Social Security, and you start publishing opinion pieces and advocating for change. What were your... This is pre-revolution, so this is the Shah's yes. time. Yes. Marigis, what were the main human rights concerns for you in the 1970s, for example, in the years before the revolution? Yeah, years before the revolution, because uh, we could uh, uh, be aware about uh, the events that was uh, happening all over the world, like uh, Vietnam uh, war, war, hippies, Beatles, and some reaction. Uh, of uh, war policy of Western government, yes. like the United States, like the Europe. And I was reading a lot the history of Iran and the history of some other. And um, you cannot believe that Binavoyan, Kitab Binavoyan, Kitab Hamishi's Tarjume should have put on Job Farsi. و مثلا من از 13 سالگی 12 سالگی من این کتاب ها رو میخوندم واقعا میخوندم و یک نالیج به من داده بود یعنی اون نالیج من اون چیزی که من از هیستوری میگرفتم از لیترچر میگرفتم با اینکه زبون نمیدونستم از خانواده ای نبودم که به من کمک بکنن برای اینکه زبان یاد بگیرم ولی اینا به من یه طرز فکر داد یه سبک زندگی توی مایندم داد حالا هرچند که بیرون از اون ما نمیتونستیم اونو پرکتیس کنیم ولی اونو به من داد که خب این بینوایان رو چی زیاد فکوس میکنه روی فقر روی این چیزی که بین فقر و ثروت هست خب این چجوری باید منیج بشه که این تغییر بکنه اما من هرگز مارکسیست نشدم هم. چون نمیدونم حتی اون موقع هم فکر میکردم این یه چیز خیلی قشنگه تو ذهن منم شکل گرفته بود ولی هیچ وقت فکر نمیکردم این بتونه عملی بشه اما طرز فکر من به سمت 
جامعه بی طبقه رفته بود. Mm-hmm. You understood class, the class structure from yeah. uh, books and and Les Misérables, mm-hmm. etc. But but you weren't necessarily a leftist or a Marxist. Yeah. What did you What did you want to change about Iran at that time in the late '60s, early '70s, when you were writing opinion pieces? What would you say your focus was? Yeah, I could not believe that a revolution, especially Islamic revolution could be happen in that uh, country. Uh, probably because uh, we had been very far from Qom mm-hmm. and the history that was uh, shaping in Qom. And after revolution, I could understand what was happening in Qom during the time that we were talking about, uh, about women's rights and equality between men and women. Mm-hmm. When I was reading Kitab Muntaziri, Khatarat mm-hmm. Muntaziri, Memoir of uh, Ayatollah right. Muntaziri, right. I could understand that, oh, we had been very far from realities in Iran. And uh, Khomeini was doing a lot and the best in Qom, not just against Shah, but against us. Let me hang on though. Let me get to the revolution. But I'm I'm still st- stuck on this part that Masan Dasol Kabla Zengalab. You know, mm-hmm. you're it's it's not no one's anticipating the revolution just yet. Um but you were trying to effect change. You were outspoken at that point. What was it that you wanted wh- what were the kinds of things that you wanted to change about Iran at that point? B- before the Inqilab. Okay, before. okay. If if you mean in dream, <laughs> I, I was looking for very good uh, change uh, toward democracy. But I don't know why. I could understand that it is not possible pretty soon. And I could understand that just we can, you know, we can see something in the future like uh, Englob, uh, like um, کودت های نظامی <تصفيق> مثل اون چیزایی که توی آمریکای لاتین اتفاق <تصفيق> میفته <تصفيق> چون ما خیلی زیاد به آمریکای اتفاقا لاتین نگاه میکردیم <تصفيق> تا مثلا به اسلام نمیدونم رادیکال <تصفيق> یا یعنی <تصفيق> اینتלקتوای اون موقع به شیلی نگاه میکردن به آرژانتین نگاه میکردن <تصفيق> ما نگاهمون اصلا به این سمت نبود خب برای فلسطینیا و به اسرائیل و اینا هم ما همون تو همون کانسپتی واقعا فکر می کردیم که خب فلسطینی ها مظلوم هن اسرائیلی ها خونه هاشون رو گرفتن اونجوری هم فکر می کردیم بنابراین من نمی تونم بگم که خیلی فکر منسجم و مشخصی برای تغییر در ایران داشتم Were you happy with Iran in the early 70s مثلا؟ No 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 I was not I was because not. it wasn't a democracy the, in the kind of one way was that and one was something that happened in 1953 the coup yeah, of uh, uh, yeah, against Mossadegh yes. uh, and I guess uh, uh, all shaping our mind political mind is coming from that event it was very important to us because I was very very small and I was in Tehran with my mom and I was on the street uh, when everything was changed mm-hmm. and I could see the people that today they were saying Marg bar, uh, bar Shah Zendebad Musaddir and the other day they were saying uh, Zendebad Shah Marg bar Musaddir so some political some political thing in my mind uh, was clashing each other and mm-hmm. I could not understand why today they are saying that and one uh, the other day they were saying that I could not you know uh, I could not focus such a thing did people know you by the 1970s in the public would the would the the, the Shah's uh, people know that there's this person creating trouble marrying his car <laughs> no I was not very yet. small very but small. but it, what you you resign from the Institute of Social Security in uh, in 1977 and you mm-hmm. start your legal career this mm-hmm. is a couple of years before the the Engala, before the revolution yes why did you why did you resign why did you start then your legal yeah, career? yeah you know it was my goal to become 
become a lawyer. Yeah, I educated in law school. I was 23 years old. Mm. But the minimum age for going to bar association and asking for license and such a thing, I... I was 23, but the age was 25. And that's why I couldn't ah. register. For everyone or that. just for women? No, no, for, for everyone. everyone. Huh. For everyone. And now it's like that, I okay. think. Uh, but two years, I was <laughs> going uh, and getting a job. And I couldn't stop it because, because I had not money, enough mm. money, you know, to continue and to resign uh, but you never thought of going back to Ahavaz. By that point, you're into no, just, Iran. And just to visit. Right. Just to visit. To, Marangis, put us on the ground around 1979 when the revolution happened. You're there. You're a lawyer then at this point. Uh, you know, I mean, as you said, no one was anticipating that this was going to become the Islamic revolution that it did. Were you among those intellectuals, the majority, in fact, mm -hmm. the, who thought, Actually, maybe this is going to be positive. This is going to be a positive change in Iran. Were you advocating for it? Did you want no, this? No, never. Never. And this is some, you know, something negative in my uh, background for revolutionary people. Hmm. Because I never followed them. But, of course, I didn't like Shah regime. Uh, and uh, sometimes that uh, Khomeini ordered for Etisabe Matbuat, mm -hmm. I didn't follow him. We didn't care about this order. And that's why the syndica of uh, journalists in Iran, the syndica of journalists in Iran, they didn't like my mozegiri. Uh, yani, yeah, a lot of the yeah. intellectuals who would be advocating yeah. for revolution yeah. must have been quite disappointed yeah, yeah. in and you. That's, that's why they. Uh, Shere Kemasan, you're not uh -huh. joining us. And yeah, being yeah, and uh, my punishment was uh, writing something against me. Nashriye uh, doshtan ki ye nashriye doshtan. که مال این سندیکا بود بعد منو مثلا تنبیه پانیشمنت یک کسی مثل من این بود که منو به عنوان کسی که تخلف کرده از یک اتصابی با درج در روزنامه اون سندیکا که اون بهترین داکیومنتی شد بعدا برای دادگاه های یا دادگاه یا به هر حال نیروهای امنیتی یا مثلا برای آقای حسین شریعت مداری روزامه که هان که پس من اساسا نیچر ضد انقلاب بودم انتای ریولوشن اسلامیک ریولوشن بودم خب این همیشه بود و من هیچ وقت تصور نمی کردم اینقدر این توجه داشته باشن بشه ولی بعدا اکس های بیهجاب من هم که توی مطبوعات دوران شاه موام هم همین قدی بود یه وقتایی که بهش میکنن اون موقع گوگوشی ولی الان دیگه گوگوش اینجوری نیست ماها هم گوگوش موندیم <تصفح> اون خیلی خوشگله و موهای قشنگی داره ولی موهای ما سفید شده But you were one of those people who was caught in the middle then you weren't necessarily a tarafdar shah but because you were also not pro revolution you were stuck in in with mm -hmm. with nobody because, supporting because, you you know because i could understand that because i think um, i had read very well the history of iran and i could understand that this is something against the mashrute this is something in galaba mashrute constitutional revolution yes. of iran uh, i could understand that uh, uh, with khomeini uh, and following Khomeini, we cannot get something better. But I couldn't believe that in God bad ke al on me binim. Yani point ke man mukhalif budam ba nemi raftam tu ye daste jot engalabe Khomeini. Az bazam injo harf az madaram bizanam ke madaram yek roz istad va go agar tu dom bal Khomeini biri, ma khodam atish mizanam. 
و بعد که من خندیدم گفتم من نمیرم دنبال خمینی گفت این چادر سرتون میکنه باز من خندیدم you wouldn't believe it no گفت میکنه شما ها اخوند نمیشناسید بنابراین خیلی خیلی روشن فکر مادرشون بود خیلی بودن خیلی بودن ولی زورشون نمیرسید یعنی جو سنگین بود یه اتمسفری بود که اون اتمسفر رو هیچ کس باش کاری نمیتونست بکنه ما هم خطر میکردیم ای واز ات ریسک دی تایم Well, this is, I mean, this is where your second act begins, since I've divided your life into these three <laughs> acts for now. And I, you, you've passed your bar exam. You've, you're licensed to practice law. This is before the revolution. But then the revolution happens, and Iran's judiciary is taken over by the clerics, and the whole judicial system changes. How did all of this affect your role as a defense lawyer, and especially as a female attorney? It was very difficult, because I couldn't go... Uh, and talk to judge yeah. because he was not looking at me and just saying, what do you want, Hohar, sister? And uh, after two years, I could understand how I can talk to them, how, how? I how did can you, act. How, how did you figure that out? You know, I... <laughs> من رفتم به بار اسوسییشنی که دیگه این بار اسوسییشن بار اسوسییشن نبود دیگه هیئت مدیرش که قبلا الکتد بودن حالا الکتد نبودن همه زندان بودن دیگه ما آفیسی نداشتیم به عنوان بار اسوسییشن که بگیم ما ممبر اونجا این ولی رفتم به یک سرایداری که اونجا شده بود حالا همه کاره گفتم اسم من بده به دادگاه های کریمینال که من حاضرم برای اونایی که پول ندارن به هر تعدادی کیس قبول کنم این قدم بزرگ من بود و واقعا این میتونه درسی باشه برای زنایی که گرفتار این ماجراهای طالبانی و داعشی تو کشورشون میشن خیلی درس مهمیه از اون به بعد دیگه این قاضی ها با من یه جوری دیگه برخورد کردن و به نظرشون رسید که من یه زن خیلی پول داریم و نیکوکار از طرف دیگه از منم حمالی میکشیدن یعنی یعنی سرم سوار میشدن بعد میگفتن چایی بر من تارف میکردن بعد میگفتن میتونیم پرونده رو بر من خلاصی کنیم من حوصله ندارم بخونم میگفتم آره اون وقت من با خوندن پرونده دو تا فایده میبوردم یکی اینکه که قاضیه با من دیگه دوست میشد یعنی دوست میشد که راحت باش برابر می نشه سم حرف میزنم یکی این که من چیزای اسلامی رو از تو این پرونده ها یاد می گرفتم چون می داد من بخونم تنبل بود خلاصه کنم بنابراین من به تدریج اکسپت و رسپکت شدم ولی خیلی سخت بود خیلی that's an, it's an amazing story uh, two steps back to think that overnight these قاضی the, the, the judges that you talk about mm-hmm. Um, basically go from respecting you to suddenly not respecting you mm-hmm. because you're a woman and now we're in the Islamic Revolution uh, mm-hmm. Republic, etc. Were they the same judges in some cases that would suddenly change their, their, their way of acting or was it yes. different people? Yeah, different. You know, all judges, they were welcome me. It is not just that or one judge, but all judges, they could be happy after this policy that uh, I started. So, so let me, you, you talked a moment ago about your mother mm-hmm. saying to you, you know, they're going to make the hijab compulsory and you, and you guys laughing about it. Come on, that's not actually yeah, going to happen. Yeah. I, I, I want to ask you about that. I mean, you have... quite famously now, been known as one of the first women attorneys to oppose the Islamization of gender relations following the revolution. Set the scene for us in this time when the laws changed. Because, I, I, you know, I remember back to my university thesis on the revolution at uh, York University and, and how at first, actually, many feminists believed this was going to be an emancipating change for Iran. There was a, you know, there were, there was, even Khomeini at one point says, oh, I, mm-hmm. you know, I'm going to advocate for women's rights, etc. What was the atmosphere like when new laws start to get passed, like compulsory hijab, for mm-hmm. When that started to happen, 
How did you deal with that from a legal standpoint? Yeah, I'm sure that you know the first position, Tazahurat, in Iran mm-hmm. uh, was making by women. Yes. In Dad Gustari, in Kahe Dad Gustari. Hobbanam Josbe Un Hobudam, Va protest me cardi Mosru, Surat Madani. Yeni peacefully, yes. Ma Shuru Kari. Misha Gufke Avalin, a terrazo, a peacefully. در ایران بعد از انقلاب رو زنان شروع کردن در سطح کشور هم بود هنوز کسی درست اینو تحقیق و بررسی نکرده هم. من تا یه حدودی در یه کتابی به نام شورش تا یه حدود کمی اینو گفتم ولی انقدر سرکوب و سپرس هیوی بود علیه ما که خب به زودی تونستن ما, رو ما تو خونه همون بمونیم نیاییم بیرون و از طرف دیگه همونجور که میدونید به هر حال جمعیت ترادیشنال پیپلی که فالو میکردن خمینی رو خیلی زیاد بود در اون اوایل انقلاب خیلی زیاد بود آمدن و با یک تمی کار کردن women against women it means that traditional women who were following without any question خمینی they organized them against us And all the time, they were inviting them uh, to come to the street and give a slogan against be hijab, against Zanane uh, without hijab. Yeah. And after Gero Gangiri, ke Sefarat Emrika ro raftan gereftan, dige ma shudim yek symbol hai az Emrika. Yani marg bar Emrika, سیمبلش مثلا زنای ماها بودیم آه، آه، آه. که در زمان شاه بی هجاب مدرسه رفته بودیم دانشگاه رفته بودیم کار کرده بودیم پس ما تو دو تا فورس قرار گرفتیم یکی این که میگفتن اگینست اسلامیک ویلیوز شما میخواییم زندگی کنین استایل ضد اسلامی رو داشته باشین با مردم آشرت کنین تو کافه برین سینما برین موسیقی گوش کنین تو پارتیاز با مردا باشین یکی دیگه هم امپریالیزم بود که حالا چپ ها هم با اون مچ شده بودن تا مدت ها و هیچ ایرادی نمی گرفتن پس ما تو دو تا چیز وسط دو تا فشار قرار گرفتیم And when they start passing laws they actually start making it the law که مثلا <laughs> women can't sing women can't, the, the, the hijab etc Was there any institutional way to fight this? No, or no, no, no institutional, no institutional. Because, you know, and uh, something that was bad during Shah was that we didn't have any independent political party. Because after Mossadegh, Shah couldn't, you know, couldn't accept such a thing. So by the time the revolution happens, there's no, no. levers for any kind of opposition. No, even when no, no, we couldn't, we couldn't organize that because uh, immediately after uh, victory of Islamic uh, revolution, همه جوان های محل رو اینا تبدیل کردن به سولجر های خودشون همه جوان ها کمیته درست کردن که همه می ترسیدن یعنی بعد هم که جنگ شد بلا فاصله همه چیز ترس بود همراه با ترس و مرگ و کشته شدن و دیگه ما اصلا رفتیم حاشیه در مرکز زنای قرار گرفتن که بچه هاشون رو جنگ زن شهید بودن مادر شهید بودن این یعنی زندگی ما دیگه یه زندگی خیلی درجه دو حاشیه‌ای شد. Everything that you had in your young life started to fight for was being taken away at that point. Yet you persist in the years after the revolution you begin writing about the basic principles of justice, human rights, equal rights for women. Your articles are published in the Women's Monthly Zanon, and mm-hmm. uh, also by the 1990s, you begin writing a series of books analyzing the various aspects of discrimination against women in Iran. In 1997, you published the book Political Rights of Iranian Women, in which you argue that Iranian women have no legal rights over their own children. Um, Merhengiz, in this period, I mean, I know that's a long period I've just described there, but in general, 
What was the reaction to this content that you would put out there in this period, either by the authorities or even by the general public? How did you get away with it, in a sense? I could understand that uh, if we don't be careful, they will kill us, like thousands of people who they were killed during 60, the highest 60 uh, Iran, 60 to 70. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found a language for criticizing the legal system without, you know, uh, they, they can accuse me as kafir, as murtad, mm -hmm. against Islam. Mm -hmm. How, what was that language? Uh, that language uh, was uh, using of uh, moderate uh, clerics, moderate clerics who they, uh, they were uh, giving us some better interpretation of uh, Islamic text. And sometimes that uh, I was asking them how I can criticize the, the age of uh, Mas'uliyat Kayfari, criminal age mm -hmm. for women uh, that is nine years old and for men is 15 years old, mm -hmm. or the age for marriage or something like that. And they were giving me very good interpretation of Islam. According to that interpretation, I was able to criticize without, without accusing as kafir, as mortad. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were saying that in that uh, text, in that uh, rawayat, in that hadith, or something like that. We can change that in our legal system without doing anything against Islam, against Sharia. So this language was much better than law. And the regime believed law. that? No, <laughs> no. The right. regime didn't believe that all the time. I was under pressure yeah. from Vizarat Etelaat, from Sepahe Pastoran, and yeah. all the time they were coming to my office. And in office, they were, you know, investigating about everything. And yeah. they were uh, advising that you better be careful. You better don't talk about something like that, something like this. Uh, and they, we, we had been under control, but we could understand the, their... یو نو ضعفاشون هم پیدا کرده بودیم یعنی ما ما هم اونا رو شناخته بودیم ما هم بلد بودیم چه جوری با اینا حرف بزنیم یعنی شما تا توی میدون نباشی میدون جنگ نباشی اصلا فکر نمی‌کنی که جنگ جویی اصلا فکر نمی‌کنی که ممکنه یکی بکشی ما مثل اون آدمایی بودیم که وسط میدون جنگ بودیم ولی شمشیر نداشتیم شمشیر ما این کارایی بود که می‌کردیم مثلا من شمشیرم این بود که برم بگم من, من از آدم های بی پول دفاع میکنم شمشیر mm -hmm. من این بود که بیام بگم آها فلان فقیه اینه گفته But even so, at that time, as you know, better than anyone They were imprisoning people, they were executing people yes. for, for almost nothing I mean, Shahnush Parsipur was on the show I a know. couple of months ago I, I mean, know Panj Dafa, five times they put I her in know. prison, they tortured I her they, uh, And what was she doing? I mean, yeah. she was writing novels, yeah. she was So it's I guess, I mean, this is sort of the obvious question that you, I'm sure you get tired of answering, but, but how do you, when in that period, how, how were you not afraid uh, to do what you were doing? I was afraid. I was afraid, but my passion was very, you know, powerful and high. And I prefer stay in Iran and don't leave Iran, but... I was careful, and I was not, I cannot say that, you know, I was John Dark, and I was <laughs> saying something very bad against the regime, but I was alive, yes. and my voice was heard. And yet, after all of that, it's your attendance at a conference in the year 2000 mm -hmm. that does end you up in, in jail, which is is 
quite strange. I mean, this is April 2000 when you and 16 other prominent reform-minded uh, Iranian intellectuals and activists attend this conference in Berlin. Mm -hmm. And for speaking at this conference, you come back to Iran, you're arrested right away. Mm -hmm. And w what were you charged with? Yeah, probably uh, because you had not been in Iran, uh, you cannot touch something that we touched it. Like, before we do have two jenah political jenah chimish being is fraction got it yeah yeah yes uh, uh, it was easier for us writing and talking against legal system in iran you know why because they couldn't accuse us that you are working with our enemy hmm. yeah, and conservative when everything was you know in the hand of conservative and we didn't have something like reformist or moderate or something like that yes they were coming to my office i was under pressure everything like that was happening you're saying when there's no organized opposition no. they don't see you as much of a threat yes you're yes. just one person doing yes you know, one person doing but after that uh, they were very afraid oh Mehrang is a car or somebody else. They are, they, they knew that we are laic, we are secular, we are anti-revolution. Uh, but now, we are supporting reform. We are supporting reformists who they, uh, you know, they believe that they are their enemy. So, in one night, after one night, we moved from some women who were talking about women's rights or human rights to Islam Taliban that they said that they are enemies of us and they want us to be with them and they want to be with America and they want to be with them. This is the fear of this regime that we are not with Islam Taliban or the people of their own who are not with them and we are not with them and we know them completely my mind, Marengis, goes to um, uh, uh, the filmmaker Bahman Farmanara, who was on this program a few months ago, and he said something interesting that, that uh, reminds me of what you're saying. He sa I said, because he's in Iran still, mm -hmm. and he says all kinds of things and makes these films, and he said, you know, but I don't sign the petitions that everybody else signs. I don't put my name yes. with everybody. Yes. So I'm just me. Yes. Some guy who's attacking them, even though I have some profile yeah. and stuff. So it's kind of what you're saying. If you are not seen to be part of some kind of organized yes. unit, yes. you're you're yes. not free, but you you're they're not as concerned about you yes. as if you're part of an yeah. organized. Yeah. yeah. But why was this conference such a big deal? It, it, it was, you know, it was organizing by reformist people, reformist leaders. And بنیاد هنریش بال که بنیاد هنریش بال یک قسمت فرهنگی یه دپارتمان یا هر چیز فرهنگی حزب سبز آلمان بود. حزب سبز آلمان تا اون موقع ماینوریتی بود. در نتیجه به عنوان ماینوریتی دائما از مجوریتی که حاکم بود ایراد می گرفت، انتقاد می کرد. که چرا با یه حکومتی که میکنوس چون اتفاق افتاده بود در آلمان چرا با حکومتی که میکنوس رو در این کشور چیز کرده شما دیل دارین رابطه دارین رابطه دارین. بعد همین ماینوریتی یه شد مجوریتی حکومت آلمان رو گرفت <تصفيق> وقتی شد مجوریتی حالا میگشت دنبال یه لجتمسی برای اینکه رابطه با ایران هم چنان وسیع تر کنه بیشتر کنه از نظر اقتصادی چون اروپا وابسته به ایرانه در نتیجه این اومدن این, این کنفرانس رو ارگانایز کردن که حالا به افکار پابلیک اپینیون خودشون در آلمان بقبولانن که ایران عوض شده و ایران دیگه تروریست نیست دیگه بیرون از ایران ترور نمیکنه. ما هم اصلا این رو نمیدونستیم برو دعوت کردن و من اولین کنفرانسی بود که نترسیدم و رفتم چون گفتم خب با خودشونم و بعد که توی یه دادگاه 
به قاضی گفتم آقا چرا انگاه ما رضیت میگنیم ما که با خودتون رفتیم آلمان گوشاش قرمز شد گفت تو با خود ما رفتی تو اینا رو از ما میدونین گفت هم خب آره گفت یک دفعه دیگه این حرف رو بزنی پوست تو میکردم پس بنابراین ما افتادیم توی حفره که اصلا خودمون نمیفهمیدیم این حفره چیه یعنی ما با هر چقدر میفهمیدیم که این دوتا جناب با همدیگه مشکل دارن ولی باور نمی کردیم این مشکلشون در این حد باشه که اساسا اینقدر که اینا با رفورمیستا بد بودن شاید میتونم بگم با من بد نبودن اگر که من نرفته بودم دنبال رفورمیستا خیلی پیچیده است ایران میدونی خیلی پیچیده است و you had at this point you would have known a lot of people who had been put in jail you would have defended some of the people who would have been put in jail uh, what was it like for you going to prison خب من اصلا زندان نمیدونستم چیه هیچ وقت زندان نرفته بودم هیچ وقت نمیخواستم آدم این جور کاری باشم مثلا خوشم نمیمد که دوست داشتم بمونم کار کنم وایسم کار کنم بشینم تو دفترم کار کنم عقیده نداشتم برای اینکه مگه اون کسایی که این همه آدم کشتن از اول انقلاب کیا بودن اونایی بودن که تو زندانای شاه بودن اون همه شکنجه شده بودن مگه مثلا اون آقایی که لاجوردی زندان ابین بیشتری شکنجه ها رو شده بود و خودش اونجور قاتلی از آب دارم اصلا عقیده نداشتم راستشو بخوای یا اینکه آدما وقتی برن زندان آدم های مهم میان من اصلا این عقیده رو نداشتم و بنابراین خودم نمیخواستم اینجوری مهم بشم من میخواستم کار کنم و مهم باشم یعنی کار روی صحنه روی استیج بکنم و هیچ چیز مخفی هم نداشتم ولی خب دیگه اینا وقتی جناهی بخوان کار بکنن هر حکومتی که بخواد جناه درون خودشو اپوزیسیون درونی خودشو که اپوزیسیون ضد ولایت فقیه که نبود که it was not really yes. anti-islamic republic just they were saying that ولی فقیه should be under control by law but you end up in Evin did you think that you're gonna die did you were you terrified were you what what was your reaction yeah, it, was, when... it was not it was not easy Af, uh, after two or three days i could understand that uh, they are they are making fake uh, files for my husband more than me yes that was something that i became you know um, scared i want to get to your husband let me just ask you this we, we, when you're in prison The story goes that you were diagnosed with cancer and under pressure from the European Union and the Netherlands, you were released on bail after 53 days to undergo an operation and chemotherapy in, in Iran. Then you end up leaving Iran for the United States around that time. How, mm-hmm. how did it happen? Yeah, because I had the green card because my brother uh, for a long time was uh, living in the United States. My step. Uh, daughter you know was American and they applied for me I had green card since 1996 but why would Iran let you go I mean why would the authorities in Iran allow you to leave yeah, they well, famously don't let anybody no, no, that they think is right. a problem you're leave right, right? Yeah. and now I, I I should explain something else for you that I'm sure you don't know You, you cannot touch it. Sometimes they were, you know, they were doing something that, like whitering, that we are lawyer, we have lawyers in Iran, we have female lawyers in Iran, uh, they are talking and you can hear their, their voice, but n- nobody knows that uh, after any interview with BBC or VOA or Uh, writing an article or interviewing uh, at my office with a foreigner uh, reporter. After that, they were coming to my office, right. and, my, uh, and I was under investigation and something. So they let you talk a little bit to use you as some yeah, kind of it, symbol it, it of openness. It was open positive or... for them. Uh-huh. It was positive for them, but it was limited. When we were going to break that limitation, oh, they 
they were Do you feel talking. like they used you? Yes. Yes, because when uh, in Berlin, I was saying that reform is not possible without having reform in constitution. It was something like red line. And I passed that. But up until that point, they were okay for you to be saying these yes. things as a demonstration that we allow dissent. Yes. We allow people to say things. Yes. And look, we have a female yes. lawyer who's without speaking Without joining with uh, reform, reformist people. Without joining like that, going to uh, Berlin and talking aloud about Iran, who, you know, who uh, Bashar Nags Karde, that Mudate Bissolike Sarekorumade, who Moke Bissol would. In Oroman Guftam, these, you know, are something that I was saying aloud in front seven Durbinoi Buzurge, Habar Guzurgi Buzurg. Hopper in a decay, Kobele Tahamol. When you leave Iran at that point in the early 2000s, then did you think? that you might never be able to go back? Did you have a sense of that? No, no. I never. You thought it might that. be a temporary be- because, trip? Or... Because I was allowed with them. I had uh, a bail, big bail. And uh, I didn't uh, take with myself something, uh, just my m- myself and Azadeh, who was teenager, under Your daughter, yeah. underage, yes. Uh, and I was going to be far from them because I was... Uh, involved with saraton, with uh, breast cancer, and uh, between six months to one year, not yeah, more. I ask you that because a few months ago, last fall, in our interview that we did about Nasrin Sotudeh, you told me that Nasrin learned from people like you mm-hmm. and Shirin Abadi mm-hmm. to not leave Iran. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and I, I was thinking about that this whole month, knowing that I'm going to get to talk to you and thinking... I mean, I wonder, going back in time, I mean, no one, no one would blame you for wanting to go to the States in the middle of being put in Evin and, and having a young family and, and having breast cancer, et cetera. But going back in time now, would you have made the choice to stay in Iran? Yes. Yes. In, in myself, I think it was wrong to leave Iran e- even for better treatment or, you know, setting up Azadeh and everything. Because when you leave Iran, mostly uh, they make fabricate, hmm. uh, fabricate file for you. And because they couldn't do that, and I had permission from uh, radical Islamic in revolutionary court and others in uh, conservatives, I was allowed, and uh, I left Iran very legally. And I think it was a mistake. And because I was under treatment, a little I was going to be weak. The mm-hmm. medicine, hemotherapy, mm-hmm. uh, radiation, and everything that was around me. And I could not believe that after I leave Iran, they will kidnap my husband and get confession, forced confession against me, morally, politically, spying, and everything that you can, you know, imagine. Well, you you started talking about it there, so I I, want to ask you, I must ask you about your... Your late husband, Siamak, uh, you're writing a book about him as well. Or, or Hopefully I, I do that. He, you, so you, you were arrested and interrogated in Iran, but you were, you were never tortured the way he was. Um, uh, Siamak Porzan, your late husband, was arrested. He was savagely tortured. Why did they go after him so harshly? Uh, you know, he was, uh, he was coming from a family that all of them, since Reza Shah, they had been monarchists. So they could not, you know, be comfortable with Siamak. But they 
didn't know all of them. I say all of them, all of نیروهای امنیتی security forces they didn't know that he is my husband how did they not know that because because they are not just one one security center one security agents we do have many security agencies because like a country that uh, they do have many, uh, many government, inside government, inside government. So he's got a double strike against him all of a yes. sudden. He's yes. identified with the Pahlavis and the market, mm-hmm. and he's marrying Isakar's husband. Yes. In Berlin conference, they could understand it, and the Revolutionary Court, they had a very big file from Siamak. And the first step that I passed to office of uh, judge before I can sit he said do you know this person the, the, there was a, a file blue file and on the cover was written Siamak Purzan Sultanat Tala monarchist and he said are you his wife? And I said, yes. And he was doing like that. So. He was nodding. Yeah. So like it was the start. It was the start. And he was forcing me that I say, everything in Berlin was organized by Siamak Epurza. Wow. And I said, no, I cannot say such a thing. My husband didn't do any role in this event. And nobody invited him to Berlin conference. It was their goal for arresting me. And after that, they, you know, in their investigating, all the time they were asking about Siamak, about background of Siamak, about background of uh, Siamak in Hollywood, um, this artist, that artist. And as you know, he was for a while, I think, um, uh, correspondent yeah. of Kehan yeah. uh, newspaper in Hollywood, and it was very, very bad thing in uh, in, in, in his yeah. year, in his year. So yeah. you 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 and you come west with Azadeh, mm-hmm. and how do you find out what they're doing with Siamak? After three months, he called us. And said that I can understand that somebody is following me, and they do have um, they do have aslahe weapon, and I can see in lule ye chizro to pango as. ما گفتیم نه تو خیال میکنی اینا تو هم کسی رو بگیرن میگیرن چرا بیان دنبال کنن؟ خب بعدا فهمیدیم که برای اینکه غیر قانونی بوده حتی نسبت به خودشون حتی نسبت, به, نسبت به اون سیستم باز این کار اینا غیر قانونی بوده و برای اینکه قانونیش بکنن اول یه پرونده مورال بر سیامک درست کرده با یک زنی که در اونجا کار میکرد این اولین برگ پیج پرونده است که بتونن بگیرنش بعد بقیه چیزا رو با فورس کامپیشه نزش گرفتن گفتن حالا یا ما بی این علت که اون زن شوهر داره و نمیدونم تو زن داری از این پرت و پلاهایی که تو قوانین شو هست سنگسارت بکنیم ولی اگه همه چیزای سیاسی خودت و زن تو بگی ما تو رو آزادت میکنیم اینو معمولا فریب میده و قسم هم میخورن که ما این فیلم ها رو پخش نمیکنیم فقط ما میخوایم اینا رو داشته باشیم برای اطلاعات خودمون برای اینکه وقتی سیامک فهمید که پخش شده سیامک از اون موقع گیواب کرد So you are in the States at this point Yes yeah. And you He is sentenced to be in jail yes. On these trumped up charges for uh, Convictions For years they, yes. for, they say at first they say eight years Or yes. ten years or something Yes No for uh, Three years he was inside jail, not just one jail, 
some jail that uh, um, so far it, ما نمیدونیم اصلا کدوم جیل بوده خودش هم نمیدونست اینا انقدر زندان های غیر قانونی و شکنجگاه دارن <تصفيق> که خودش هم نمیدونست کجاها بوده <تصفيق> تا یه چهار ماه اون رو آزاد کردن برای اینکه به علت خیلی کارهایی که ما بیرون از ایران میکردیم سه تا کشور اروپایی فشار رو برده بودن فکر میکنم انگلیس و فرانسه و همون هلند یا سه تای دیگه بودن اینا سیامک آزاد کردن به دروغ بعد وادارش کردن که شکایت هایی رو که من کرده بودم از اینکه غیر قانونی بوده دستگیریش اونا رو از آمریکا شکایت میکرد از آمریکا به ایران شکایت میکردن اینا یه چیزای دیگه شما خسته میشین اگه آدم بخواد بگه مکانیزم های بود اون موقع آه آه. که مثلا بهش میگفتن اصل نود قانون اس کمیسیون اصل 90 قانون اساسی من مرتب با آقای کروبی در تماس بودم که اون موقع مجلس ششم بود اصلاح طلبات اون مجلس رفته بودن و میخواستم برگردم آقای کروبی میگو برنگ میخواستم به وسیله خانم طالبانی اومده بود امریکا یادداشت نوشتم براشون فرستادم شفاهی جواب منو دادن که آقای خاتمی که اصلا شما این طرف ها پیدا نشه چون ما نمیتونیم کمک بد بکنیم پیش آقای ظریف رفتم گفتم شما من امنیت بدین من برم ایران حداقل فرودگاه منو نگیرن برای اینکه فایدهش چیه من دیگه برای سیامک که نمیتونم دیگه کاری بکنم آقای ظریف هم گفت متاسف نه یا نه, نه اینجا بود نیویورک بود اون موقع آه. آه. گفت به شما دون کام تو گفت که گفت میتونی بری ولی فرودگاه میگیرن این شخصا آقای ظریف من گفتم من باید برم آقای ظریف برای اینکه یه زندگی متلاشی شده بچه های منم دارن دیوونه میشن اونم که اونجا تنها مونده گفت خب برو میگیرنت بعد من سعی میکنم ساپورتت کنم خب گفتم اینم که نشد این, این به درد ما نمیخوره چون این دو تا دختر جوان و تینیجر من از بین میره به هر حال خیلی سعی کردم خودشون از درون کشور میگفتن نه یا این I'm so sorry that I mean even it, I, I to talk about this. Man, I should have got out of my damn bureau. But what would you have been able to do if I you were know. there? Yeah, you're right. You are right. But I cannot, you know, I cannot. Uh, the, the, this ends quite myself. It ends quite uh, tragically in 2011. How, how do you tell us how you found out the news or what? What? Just uh, Lily was on phone with him. Your daughter Lily. Yeah. my daughter Lily from Canada, from Toronto, because we had organized everything for leaving Iran illegally. For him to leave Iran? Mm-hmm. 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 And it was very safe, because from Iqlim Kurdistan, and everything was, you know, mm-hmm. and the hospital was, uh, you know, ready uh, for, but uh, in Bere Unjo Bechabe for Antwi Iqlim Kurdistan. و اون تن نمیداد میترسید سنش بالا بود سیامک و دیگه قدرت ریسک نداشت این های ریسک نمیتونست تحمل بکنه به هر حال من معتقدم که خودکشی کرد ولی معتقدم که این خودکشی به علت فشارهای منتالی بود که به هر حال از طرف حکومت برش تحمیل شد از طرف امنیتی ها و اینکه ولش نمیکردن دائما میرفتن سراغش و دیگر اینکه از اینکه آمده بود و علیه به هر حال من دوستانش حرف زده بود اون شرم از این اقرار اجباری یه شرم خیلی آزاردهنده و همه اینا دست به دست تنها موند و بسیاری از دوستانش رهاش کردند بعضی از دوستان باهاش بودن مونتا اونها هم بعد از گرفتاری 88 همه خودشون یه جوری ترسیده بودن و دیگه سراغ سیامک نمیرفتن واقعیتش اینه و سیامک تنها راهی که خودش حس کرده بود براش باقی مونده همون بود که انجام داد و به هر حال برای ما خیلی سخت بود و هست هنوز مخصوصا برای دخترای من احساس میکنن 
هیچ وقت نتونستن به پدرشون برسن نتونستن کمکش کنن اما گما میکنم کار تاریخی مهم میکرد سیامک یعنی نشون داد که این آدمایی که میان و تأیید میکنن جمهوری اسلامی جلوی تلویزیون اینا آدمای گرفتاری هستن خیلی زیر ضربه بودن و خب این کارش اعتراض بود اعتراض خیلی با صدای بلند بود یعنی خیلی صدای این اعتراض بلندتر از این بود که مثلا صد تا قرص میخورد و میمرد این خیلی س... یعنی صدای تاریخی داره از نظر هیومن رایتس been through so much that's a lot yeah. and that's why I think that if I didn't leave Iran probably something happened different with that. but you can't yeah you can't how, how do you no, I'm talking honestly with you I know you are but I'm and I'm t- talking honestly back and saying you that's the, the, the it's unfair to yourself to think that you could have done something yeah. I mean there's a 40 year history of this regime acting in lawless ways and to think that if you had stayed in Iran somehow you would have magically made things different it's yeah. it's um yeah you can see my picture in this uh, some film from I don't know uh, 42 years ago you can see that I I was talking I was very young but I was talking about the situation of Iran about the censorship about it so I was Hamishi man به هر حال صدا داشتن I had voice ولی قرار نبوده که من still have a voice yeah. but it, this voice is not powerful like, like voice that we had inside Iran you never you know uh, I'm going to ask you about that, that I won't keep here forever by the way I know mm-hmm. this has been going long but I will, I'll ask you about that in a second but just on this note of all you've been through Every time I see you mm-hmm. in on you're on television or you're doing you're making an appearance you, you're so composed you don't seem emotional you don't I mean you really hold yourself together how how, how have you learned to be so um How did this, all of this not crush you? I mean, do you have moments at home where you just go into a corner of a room and, and cry and you don't let the world see it? <laughs> really? I mean, you've been through a lot. Yeah, this is my nature. You know, sometimes, sometimes something is nature. Nothing else. Strength is your nature? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes I am very sad, but nobody can uh, feel that. They were saying that, oh... She is smiling. She And why not? Why don't you let people see that? This is my nature. Hmm. A moment ago when you said um, you think you could have done more in Iran, um, do, do, do you believe activists like yourself and others who have been bravely speaking out in the diaspora, outside of Iran, have been able to affect change in, inside in, 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 in Iran in, in recent years? I mean, I, a lot of people are trying outside of Iran, but based on what you've just been saying, you think that the change has to come from within. This is a very difficult question. We cannot predict of Iran because everything is very complicated. It's not, you know, Roshani, Sarihni, این حکومت خیلی پیچیده است خیلی کامپلیکیتد الان خیلی سلاح دست اسلحه دست جوانایی که ضرورتا نباید بود ما زمان شاه یه همچین چیزی نداشتیم این مشکل درست اونم یه حکومت خیلی منسجمی بود ولی یه دستگاه اطلاعاتی داشت صد تا دستگاه اطلاعاتی که نداشت ساواکو داشت مثلا فرض کن. هر چقدر هم بخوان بگن یه ساواک رو میگن هیچ وقت شما شنیدی مثلا بگن ما ده تا ساواک داشتیم یه تونه ساواک داشتیم کارهای بعد هم زیاد کرد این حکومت حکومتیه که اصلا اصلا برای مردم ارزشی قائل نیست یعنی برای شهروند برای 
سیتیزن ارزشی قائل نیست فقط برای اینکه خودشو خیلی قلدر نشون بده فقط یعنی همش همینه غیر از این نیست آقای خامنه ای که اومد خب همه فکر کردن حالا شاید بالاخره یه درسایی از اون یکی کارهای بد اون یکی گرفته باشه و خب الان داریم میبینیم دیگه مرگش نگرانی داره من که معلوم نیست این همه آدمی که نشستن که بیان سر جای این قدرت های قدرت هایی رو بیان تصاحب بکنن همشون هم اسلحه دارن همشون هم کانون های قدرت سیاسی هستن داره. اینا چجوری با هم گلاویز میشن و ای کاش قبل از مرگ ایشون یه اتفاقی در ایران میفتاد که ما شاهده Do you actually think the way the Islamic tre- uh, Republic treats مثلا political prisoners, prisoners of conscience we see the execution still back. Do you think it's actually worsened in recent years? یعنی بدتر شده اصلا بله بدتر شده ببینید دهه اول انقلاب ما باید کنار بذاریم چون اون کشدار دستجات سیاسی بود این دسته های چپ دسته های نمیدونم مجاهدین آره اینایی که پرچم داشتن فلاگ داشتن میگفتن ما این مثلا همشون هم در انقلاب ساپورتر خمینی بودن و بعد خب میخواستن یه سهم از قدرت داشته باشن مهمترین دعوایی که وجود داشت این بود که این سازمان ها میگفتن خب این انقلاب همه ما هندل کردیم نمیدونم هدایت کردیم پس همه ما باید تو قدرت باشیم وقتی خمینی معلوم شد که زیر عباش چیه خب شروع کرد اینا رو کشتن اینا هم اینا مقاوم بودن اینا هم دست مثل ما نبودن که بگن حالا ما میاییم و مثلا نمیدونم مقاله می نویسیم و نقد می کنیم و زندگی جامعه مدنی درست میکنیم و اینو اصلا میخواستم در قدرت بیان و خب خیلی هم با ظالمانه اینا رو حذف کردن غیر از اون دهه شما بعدا میبینین که وضعیت کمی بهتر شده <تصفيق> کمی بهتر شده مثلا قبل از اینکه اون اصلاحات شروع بشه با همه اینکه نتایجش خیلی گرفتاری های دیگه به وجود بود ولی مثلا ما کیهان رو میگرفتیم اطلاعات رو میگرفتیم تو صفحه های لایی شما جورنالیسی میدونی اهمیت بی اهمیتی چیزی که تو صفحه های لایی یه جای کوچولو نوشته بود دیروز سی نفر در زندان اوین سی ضد انقلاب ادام شدن تمام ولی بعد از اینکه خاتمی رو مردم واقعا اووردن با اون کار عجیب رای دادنشون هرچی سکولار بود هرچی لایک بود هرچی هنرمند بود آرتیست بود رفتن بهش رای دادن بعد از اون ما یک دوران بهتری رو شاهدیم منتا زیر کنترل زیر کنترل ولی من جز به کسانی بودم که قبل از اصلاحات کار میکردم یعنی شیش سال قبل از اصلاحات من کارم شروع کردم و من حذف نمی شدم اگر که ما وارد اصلاح طلب ها اصلا بدون تردید آدم اون موقع وارد این قبیله می شد برای اینکه یه خورده بیشتر مردم دوستشون داشتن اون اول مردم دوستشون داشتن و بعد هم مردم دوستشون نداشتن برای ما هم دنبال اونایی بودیم که به هر حال فضای فضای مطبوعاتی خیلی باز شده بود نه صد درصد ولی خیلی باز شده بود مردم از ساعت چهار سوم می رفتن دم پیشخون روزنامه ها صف می کشیدن. تاریک بود هوا که روزنامه مبادا تموم بشه این هرگز در تاریخ ایران سابقه نداشت پس بنابراین آره دوران مختلف بهتر و بدتر شدن هیومن رایتس داریم But what's happened in the last few years? خب بحث هستهی بود بحث وقتی که اینا اعلام کردن که ما داریم البته من نمیدونم میگن مجاهدین خلق اول اینا رو لو دادن و بعد اینا مجبور شدن بیان بگن و عضو آژانس شدن و بعد اروپا هم دنبال روی کرد از امریکا در تحریم ها بنابراین یه ریزه ما مثلا امیدی که داشتیم به اروپا که یه خورده نگوتیشن میکرد فقط هیومن رایتس کار دیگه نمیکرد اونا رو هم ما از دست دادیم برای اینکه اروپا هم اومد دنبال امریکا طبعا غرب نمیخواد ایران غنی سازی داشته باشه 
از اون به بعد دیگه اینا لج با دنیا رو بیشتر پیش بردن و دائما هم گفتن خب چه حقوق بشری که ما رو تحریم کردن و نمیدونم از این حرفایی که واقعا بی ارزشه ولی برای حکومت ظالم برای حکومت که میخواد پوپولیستی عمل بکنه و کار بکنه طبیعتا این نعمت بود اینا نعمت بود که همونطور که خمینی گفت جنگ نعمت بود راستم گفت برای خودشون نعمت بود این تحریم ها هم برای اینکه اینا بمونن نعمت بود چون خودشون مظلوم در دنیا جلوه دادن ولی after all this you're still hopeful میدونی چرا میگم mm-hmm. because you're still speaking out <laughs> if you weren't if you That's... didn't believe there was any hope you would stop sure yeah perhaps but sometimes when i'm talking with myself i judge myself that i am addicted uh-huh. <laughs> well this is i and i'll just ask a couple more questions before i let you go but on this question i wanted to ask you because you know when it comes to the human rights struggle for uh, in iran mm-hmm. it's not You know, there's people who fight for things and they can accomplish them. And th- this is not going to end anytime soon. This mm-hmm. is an ongoing struggle. Mm-hmm. And as you know, people are exhausted. I mean, even when we do a show like uh, the one we did focused on Nasrin So Today, we get feedback from the, some of the audience saying, we don't want to listen to this anymore. We just want happy things, you know. <laughs> You've had this long career in law. You were on the front lines of taking governments to task before and after the revolution. You've always been vocal. You've always been fighting for freedom. But there's the death of your husband, the, the, all that you've been through, the, 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 the personal struggles you've had, your, the health issues. Uh, you keep persisting. Yeah. No, it's okay now. No one would blame you if you say, okay, you know what? <laughs> now I'm on a... <laughs> now, now it's beachside for And the rest of I the... That's why I say I'm addicted. <laughs> What are you addicted to? I don't know. Because yes, you know. You're the smartest person What's I know. That? You know. What, you, what is it you're addicted to? Wanting, to? wanting to create change? How you guess. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on to you. <laughs> But you're, we're laughing. But this is... I, I am... amazed at the energy that you continue to have for doing such difficult work. Yeah, but now it is getting hard to me. Working. Working. Because I think we need something more than talking and writing for changing them. And we don't have any tool for that. Hmm. I don't know what's that. We cannot say the United States come and save us. How? This is Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Syria. <laughs> and we cannot ignore of supporting by uh, Western countries we cannot ignore that you know everything is full of conflict in our mind how do you react to the fact that our community especially outside of iran is so divided about the answers to how to fix things we cannot we cannot we cannot have a very uh, Unified. Clear and uh. unified answer. We cannot. Why can we not? I mean, oh, you because, mean... Because opposition of this government inside and outside Iran is divided. Yes. It's yes. not united. Not united um, at all. Just united in one issue. They are not united. Either in one issue. They cannot close to each other very much. We need that. We cannot close human rights organization, Iranian human rights organization, united, believe me. 
either yeah, human you rights or human rights organizations we can't agree on. No, but ham nemi chasba. Ham nemi chasba. Agar khali ba khali don bal kani un mige un mal jamuri islami un mige un mal nemi dunam. خوشحالی <laughs> اکتیویست ها سازمان ها حالا اکتیویست ها انقدر مهم نیست که این همه سازمان داریم اینا هم کنار هم قرار نمی گیرن تبدیل کنم خودشون رو به یک جنبش جنبش حقوق بشری حالا از آوتساید ایران باش باش ولی خودشون رو تعریف کنن به عنوان یک یه دونه فقط یه دونه جریان حقوق بشری که با هم راه میرن اون سازمان خودش رو میخواد بگه اون سازمان خودش رو میخواد بگه اون یه آش شل قلم کاریه راستش بگه نمیدونم شل قلم کار خوردی یا نه خیلی خوشمزه است it's like a, it's an آش with a lot of different things خیلی خوشمزه است ولی خوشمزه at least it tastes good uh, I, I am so honored that you've taken the time that you, you have to, to, to talk about your personal journey, to talk about some very difficult issues. Um, and I, it, it is such a stroke of luck that you haven't been in Washington, D.C., that you've, you're here in Toronto, that we could mm-hmm. do this in person. It was my pleasure. If I, can, if I were to ask a final question, I might say, you know, it's been 20 years that you've been exiled. Mm-hmm. Um, from uh, the country that uh, of my ancestry, but that a place that I never lived in, but you did for many years. Uh, what what do you miss the most about Iran? My office, my very small office. That's it. You not, just want to be in your office else. working. Yeah, because that that was my id identity that very small office. I had been in very beautiful office in the United States, at Harvard, at Brown University, and I don't know, everything that you were. The long list of your accomplishments? <laughs> long list that you were. <laughs> I mean, yes, yes. it's quite yeah. incredible. No, yeah. no, just my office that is sold now, it's not me. Mm-hmm. But in my mind, I am sitting in my office in Tehran, Meidan Hafte Tir, Khiyaban Qa'em Maqam Farahani, Kuche Yekom, Shumare Yebist, Tabaqe Yedu. That's it. Iran Bariman Hamne. Yani Hamichis was. میاد توی همین آفیس چون این آفیس همه چیزای زندگی من هم بچه ها می اومدن که بچه بودن اونجا آزاده اونجا مشق می نوشت خبرنگار های خارجی می اومدن اونجا سفارت خونه های اروپایی دائما با من در تماس بودن از تمام رادیو ها با من در تماس بودن کلاینت های من هم که مثلا محکوم به داشتن می شدن به سنگسار، استونینگ، یا به ادام، یا به شلاق اونا هم اونجا بودن سیامک هم گاهی می اومد پس بنابراین من همه چیزم پنجاه متر جاز و اون دفتری که از من گرفتن و برای همین هیچ وقت نمی بخشم شد مرسی مرسی من هم از شما That's an interview with Mehrangiza Kar in the Rook studio, part of our Best of Rook series. This is full time for Rook for today. Tune into the Best of Rook every Monday and Thursday for all of August. For all things Rook related at any time of day or night, head to our website, rookmedia.com, R O Q E media.com, where you can also support us by pressing the support us button and find all of our programming, including. 
the Contemporary History of Iran series. Thanks to the amazing team who put this show together. Super Parry Sauce, Smart Pega, Savvy Rohan, Bearded Omid, Talented Anahita, and Sound Person Louise. Thank you to all of you out there supporting us and sharing our content. Please subscribe if you've not done so already. You can find me on Instagram at Gian Gomeshi. And in the meantime, as ever, Mizubashi. Mizubashi.